Dead America, Low Country, Part 16. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter 1. Day Zero, Plus 27. As the sun came up on another day, Dante and Lily cuddled together on their makeshift bed in a classroom. Her arms were locked around his neck, not wanting to let him go. Today was going to be a difficult day. Dante shifted, moving to sit up, but she pulled him back down, burying her head into his chest. He chuckled a bit, the sound reverberating into the side of her head. It relieved a little bit of the tension, which was nice because this was so out of character for her. It was understandable, though. With the invitation from their QXR spy to come to Paris Island, this whole situation was incredibly dangerous. Do you really have to go? She murmured against his skin. He nodded. I do, he replied. Why can't you let those military guys handle it? She asked, voice a little clearer as she looked up at him, resting her ear against his shoulder. They're trained to do this kind of thing. Because it's for my sister, he explained, though he knew she knew this already. If the situation was different, and it was Ace being held captive by these lunatics, wouldn't you risk it all to go get him? She raised an eyebrow. For Ace? She snorted. Hell no. They shared a laugh and he tilted his head back and forth. Okay, what if it was me? He tried, kissing the top of her head. She took a deep breath. Yeah, you're right. She ran a finger absently along the ridges of his chest. I would go after them for you. He squeezed her tightly and they lay in silence for another moment. Can I ask you something? she finally murmured. He brushed her must hair from her forehead. Sure, he said. Do you think Grace will like me? she asked, and wrinkled her nose with embarrassment. I mean, I'm just a country girl, and y'all aren't from around here. He chuckled, shaking his head. If he'd thought she was out of character before, shy worried Lily was next level. Frankly, I think she'll just be happy I finally found myself a girlfriend, he admitted. She pulled back a bit, eyes widening in faux surprise. What? she gasped. You telling me you didn't have a little black book back home? As shocking as you might find it, Dante drawled, motioning to his face. Being this beautiful didn't exactly bring the women a-running in my direction. She rolled her eyes. Oh, so what you're saying is the big city is full of shallow bitches? she said. That's a fair assessment, he agreed with a chuckle. Nice mix of them and hipsters. She shook her head. I swear, if we ever go to Seattle, I'm going to feel like a possum in a shopping mall, she said. That's a new one, he replied, winking down at her. But accurate, she replied, holding up a finger. Cute, useful, but overwhelmed and totally out of place. He laughed, hugging her close again. If it's any consolation, I can't imagine hipsters were well equipped to handle a zombie apocalypse so they'd be the possum, he insisted, minus the cute and useful bit, of course. Wow, that is amazing to think about, she said wistfully. A world without hipsters. Maybe this whole apocalypse thing isn't so bad. They shared another laugh, effectively taking their minds off the day ahead. Finally, Dante patted her arm. You ready to get the day going? he asked. She let out a loud sigh before squeezing his neck again pressing her lips into the hollow of his throat. One more minute, she murmured against his skin. He grinned and relented, letting their bodies melt together for one more moment of peace and happiness. They didn't get that moment, however, as a gunshot went off from the roof. It wasn't too concerning, considering Miles had been popping them off periodically over the past few days whenever a stray zombie had found its way too close to camp. There were plenty of booby traps in the woods surrounding the school, but it wasn't total coverage. About thirty seconds later, another gunshot cracked. Sounds like he has a busy morning, Dante muttered. Thirty seconds later, another shot went off, and the couple sat up, brows furrowed. Are we being attacked? Lily asked. Dante shook his head. If we were, we'd be hearing a lot more shots, he replied. Most likely it's a small group of them. Come on, let's go see what's up. They got up, throwing on daytime clothes and shoes before heading into the hallway as another shot went off. 
When they emerged from the classroom, Terrell turned towards them, lowering the walkie-talkie he had in his hand. Everything okay? Dante called. The captain nodded. Yeah, we're good, he replied. Just a small pack of zombies. Nothing to worry about. Another shot went off. What's your definition of small? Lily asked, raising a hand. Terrell shrugged. Something one man with a rifle can handle? he asked. She hesitated for a moment and then nodded. Yeah, okay, I'll accept that answer, she agreed. Any idea where they came from? Dante asked. Terrell shook his head. Probably just some stragglers, he suggested. What about Francis leaving? Lily asked, crossing her arms. Could that have pulled some of those things to the bridge, break the barricade? Terrell tilted his head back and forth. They left last night for the safe house, so it's possible, he admitted. But until Miles calls for backup, we won't have to worry. We can talk about it at the meeting. He motioned for them to follow him, and once the couple caught up, they walked towards the cafeteria. Others made their way down as well, and when they entered through the double doors, Ace and Tate were in the kitchen, whipping up some food. Coleman sat at one of the tables with Maddox, the latter still morose-looking, his head hanging low. Come on in, y'all, Ace bellowed from behind the grill. About got breakfast ready, Lily grimaced. Anything besides powdered eggs and canned meat, she called. Her cousin shrugged. Found some powdered creamer for the coffee? he asked, and then smirked. Or do you take your coffee like you take your men? You mean hot, strong, and without unnecessary filler? she asked, throwing Dante a wink. Yep, just like that. Ace chuckled and nodded, turning back to the grill. Durrell took a seat next to Maddox, who still hadn't looked up. How are you hanging in there, man? he asked gently. The redneck clenched his fists. About ready to start kicking some ass again, he growled. There you go, Terrell declared, smacking him on the back. That's good, because we're gonna need you. Another shot went off from the roof. I'm starting to think we have a problem, Coleman muttered, looking up. Terrell nodded. Yeah, we're gonna have to deal with it too, he agreed. Ace and Tate exited the kitchen with platters of food and dishes, setting them down in front of everyone. Here we go, hot and fresh as this stuff is gonna get, Tate declared with a flourish. So dig in. They all pulled food from the trays, loading up their plates, and Tate went back to grab coffee cups, bussing them back to the table. There were a few moments of silence, the only sound those of slurping and chewing, before Terrell pulled out the note he'd received yesterday and tossed it on the table. Paris Island, 10 a.m. tomorrow, come ready for battle. Well, there's no use in ignoring the elephant in the room, the captain declared. Coleman, Dante and I are going on a field trip today to see what this is about. Maddox sat up straight. I'm going too, he declared. Terrell shook his head. I'm sorry, but you're not, he replied firmly. The redneck slammed his palm down on the table, rattling the mugs as his eyes blazed. But they... I know what they did, Terrell cut in, his tone leaving no room for argument. But this is not the time for you to get your revenge. We're walking into a hornet's nest, and I need people beside me that I know can handle the situation. Even seeing what Dante can do, I'm hesitant to take him along. But I get the sense that this note was meant for him. The man in question nodded. The big bold guy, he suggested. Your friend from the bridge? Coleman asked, turning to his captain. Terrell nodded thoughtfully. He might not realize we're here, he said. So having Dante along might make that situation go a little smoother. That's pretty thin, Ace said, pointing at him with his fork. The captain shrugged. Yeah, I'm aware, he replied. But thin's better than nothing. Then what the hell am I supposed to do? Maddox snapped, throwing down his utensils. Just sit on my ass and wait until you give me permission to take revenge? Another two shots went off in quick succession, and Terrell pointed up towards the roof. I need you to deal with that, he said firmly. Find out where they're coming from. My guess is the northern bridge. But if not, you get to go on a hunt. Maddox slumped in his chair, giving a begrudging nod. Yeah, fine, he muttered. As long as I get to kill something today. They continued to eat in silence for a moment, 
until Ace took a deep breath and leaned forward on his elbows. Okay, I'll be the asshole then, he said loudly. How in the hell are we sure this whole Paris Island thing isn't a trap? Dante shook his head. If whoever left the note wanted us dead, they could have just attacked this place, he said. Or lobbed artillery at us, Coleman added. Or drone strike, Terrell suggested. Lily raised her hand. Or what about those... She trailed off, moving her arm in a chopping motion. Oh, damn, what's the name of them? Not a hatchet. Tomahawk? Dante asked, raising his eyebrow. She snapped her fingers and pointed at him. Yeah, she exclaimed. Tomahawk missiles. They could have used one of them. Be a bit overkill, wouldn't it? Dante asked. She shrugged. Not like they're going to do much good against zombies, she pointed out. So use them if you got them, right? Okay, okay, Ace drawled, raising his palms. Y'all are right. I'm a dumbass. Y'all ain't got to get so excited about it. Laughter rippled around the group, and the trio of the day quickly inhaled the rest of their breakfast. Terrell got to his feet. Well, boys, we gotta get a move on if we're going to stay on their timeline, he declared. Coleman stood up, carrying a fistful of fried meat as he moved. Dante got up, and Lily grabbed his hand, stopping him for a moment. They stared at each other for a moment, and he gave her fingers a tight squeeze before they let go their gaze and affection doing the talking for them. Well, hell, y'all, Ace drawled. Guess we should get a move on, too. Maddox grunted. Why, those things ain't going anywhere, he snapped. Enjoy your breakfast. You all did a good job fixing it up, after all. The others listened to him, though stayed on high alert at the frigidness of his body. He was clearly still stewing about not being able to go with the others. Chapter 2 No Name sat in a small office, constantly looking at his watch and seeing that it was only a couple of hours away from his scheduled visit. He was not a man who got nervous or worried, not usually, especially given the tight spots he'd been in over the years. Even so, the gambit he was embarking on gave him pause, raising his heart rate enough to notice. A knock on the door interrupted his clock watching, and the bald mercenary raised his gaze. Come in he called. A mercenary cracked open the door and peeked inside. Commander, the chopper is coming in, he said. Thank you, No Name replied. I'll be there in just a minute. The mercenary nodded and moved to pull away, but his superior cleared his throat, making him pause. Yes, sir? he asked slowly. How many teams do we have on base? No Name asked. The mercenary's brow furrowed. We have three strike teams and two guard teams he replied. I want the strike teams ready to roll in ten, No Name said. The mercenary's eyes widened. Sir? he asked, voice clearly confused. I received some intel this morning, and while I'm not one to overreact, I want to proceed with an abundance of caution, especially if Delta is operating in the area, No Name explained, holding his hands in front of him as if to accentuate his point. Yes, sir, the mercenary replied, nodding furiously. We'll assemble out front in ten. No name nodded as the mercenary rushed off to complete his task. The bold mercenary sat for another brief moment, taking in a deep breath to collect himself. The semi-peaceful moment was broken by the sound of an inbound helicopter, and he sighed, getting to his feet. He put on his game face, squared his shoulders, and headed out to meet the chopper. The vehicle landed about fifty yards from the front of the building, no Name watched as Kemp hopped out and headed towards him, his brow furrowing at the sight of Charlie getting out a few moments later. Kemp reached his superior quickly with a few seconds to spare before Mosley's man was within earshot. You got a tail? No Name muttered. Yeah, the prick was real insistent on tagging along, Kemp replied. Gonna make this a little more difficult, especially when company arrives. No Name tongued his cheek. Message delivered then? He asked. Yep. Kemp confirmed. The bold mercenary took a deep breath. So, what do you think, divide and conquer? He asked. Works for me, Kemp agreed. Charlie strolled over as if he didn't have a care in the world, and the helicopter took back off, heading towards Hilton Head. So, you mind telling me what in the hell we're doing here? He demanded. You mean to tell me you can't handle base protection on your own? 
Don't mistake you being allowed to follow us around like a lost puppy to you being able to demand answers from me. No name drawled, condescension thick in his tone. Charlie rolled his eyes. So, what do you need us to do? He snapped. Well, I have three teams going out in patrol of the area. No name explained. So, if you want to make yourself useful, you can go along with them. Charlie shook his head, jutting out his chin. No way. I am not leaving you two on your own, he snarled. Very well, No Name replied. Kemp, join up with the teams. Charlie looked at both of them, seemingly unsure of how to properly respond. He let out a huff finally and pointed to No Name. I'm not leaving your side, he snapped. So, what are we looking for on patrol? Kemp asked, ignoring their surly companion. Had some increased reports of zombie sightings. The bold mercenary replied, And since Delta is in the area, we want to keep an eye out for them. They might make a play for this place. Charlie threw up his hands. Why in the hell would they do that? He demanded. Because they might decide they need supplies. No name shot back. And this would be a great one-stop shop, provided you know it's here. They turned back towards the building as three SUVs pulled up and men poured out to assemble their gear. So... Where are we patrolling? Kemp asked. No name motioned as he spoke. Have one team on pick-off duty to make sure the stragglers don't become a mob, he replied. And the others? His partner continued. Have one team patrol the east, no name ordered. And I want your team over by the bridge into Beaufort. Charlie scoffed. The guards we have there aren't enough? He asked. You obviously never encountered Delta, no name said simply, and then inclined his head to Kemp. Now get a move on, he said. You got it, Commander, his subordinate replied, and grabbed his stuff heading off to the convoy. Pretty clever splitting you two up, Charlie said with a snare. Still gonna take a lot more than that to shake me. No name rolled his eyes. Well, you better pick up the pace, because there's a lot to get done around here, he said, and began walking back towards his office at a brisk pace. The other mercenary rushed to catch up, and his bold superior watched the patrols head out. I've done all I can to make a path to the base, Dante, he thought. I can only hope you have Delta with you. Chapter 3 Terrell drove Coleman and Dante down back roads towards Buford. Despite their relative secludedness, everyone was on guard, keeping an eye out for QXR. So... You two done stuff like this before? Dante finally asked. Coleman snorted. You mean storm an occupied military base with God only knows how much resistance with little to no intelligence? He asked. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we have. The soldiers shared a chuckle, shaking their heads. Dante raised his eyebrow. And here I was thinking that Delta would be getting the best intelligence out there, he retorted. Pretty sure being Delta just meant we got thrown into the deep end because they knew we could handle it, Terrell said dryly. As shitty as that sounds, Dante said thoughtfully, it's good to know they prepared you for what we're walking into. Coleman sighed. If I had a dollar for every situation like this we've managed to walk away from, he said wistfully. We'd probably still be broke as hell, Terrell added. But we could at least have gotten a few six-packs. The trio broke into laughter as they continued driving. After another few minutes, the captain pulled off the road, pulling into a shady area underneath some trees that provided some cover. Either military bases aren't what they used to be, or we're hiking, Dante said, looking around. Terrell nodded. The bridge to Beaufort is about half a mile up, he explained. Based on what you told us about the last time you came up here, my guess is that bridge is occupied. Yeah, that's probably a safe bet, Dante agreed and got out of the vehicle. They all got out, Terrell and Coleman grabbing their assault rifles with their handguns at their sides, Dante settling for a baseball bat. Coleman raised an eyebrow and held up his gun. You know, we could have gotten you one of these if you wanted, he said. Dante held up his bat in response. It's all good, he replied. I'm more up close and personal. Even if it's a QXR mark? the sniper asked. Dante smirked. Especially if it's a QXR merc, he said. I didn't spend all those years in the octagon for nothing. Coleman chuckled and the trio began their way through the brush towards the bridge. After several minutes they came up to a clearing near the road. 
where Terrell motioned for them to stay back. He laid down, crawling up to the edge of the road, looking down towards the bridge. There were two SUVs there, with a few guards. One of them laid on the hood, leaning up against the windshield, and the other sat on a folding camping chair, kicked back like it was a lazy Sunday afternoon. The captain crawled back to cover. So, were you right? Coleman whispered. Yeah, we got three of them up there, Terrell replied with a nod. Coleman cocked his head. Can we take them? he asked. Oh, no doubt, but I don't think we should, the captain replied. If a patrol comes through here after we do our handiwork, we're going to be on one hell of a clock. The sniper raised an eyebrow. Well, what do you suggest? he asked. I'm not real keen on swimming the channel here, he motioned to the water behind him, about half a mile wide. Major road and waterway like this, there has to be some docks nearby, Dante suggested. Maybe we get lucky and someone left us a boat. Coleman nodded slowly. And if they didn't? he asked. Then I'd suggest the backstroke if you aren't a great swimmer, Dante replied simply. Terrell smirked and smacked his partner on the shoulder. Come on, let's go find us a ride, he said, and led the men down the shoreline. They made sure to stay in the brush about ten yards away from the water, hiking for a half a mile or so before they spotted an opening. Slanted pavement into the water, Dante said quietly, pointing. That's gotta be it. Still too close to the bridge. Terrell replied, drawing his knife, so going to have to go silent. Coleman produced his blade and Dante raised his bat, and the two followed the captain towards the clearing ready to fight. Terrell caught a glimpse of the dock. Two trucks on the far end of the small paved area, one of which with a boat on the trailer. Four zombies milled about, staggering aimlessly from the lack of a present meal. Terrell held up four fingers, waving for his companions to come out of hiding. He motioned to the creatures with a flourish. You want to do the honors? He asked Dante, who nodded and clanged his bat on the ground a couple of times, sending a metallic ring throughout the air. The ghouls turned and spotted the trio of humans, mouths opening in excited moans and shambling in their direction. This spread them out a bit as they converged on their spot. The group stepped up, delivering easy kill strikes to the monsters' heads, making quick work of the threat. Once the corpses fell, the trio paused for a moment, listening carefully, to make sure there was nothing else nearby waiting to emerge. Coleman, get that truck running, Terrell instructed. Dante and I will clear the bodies. The sniper nodded and approached the extended cab truck, reaching for the door handle. He gave it a good yank but found it locked, and then instantly stumbled back as a zombie smacked against the inside of the back window. He tripped over himself and fell onto his ass, causing the other two men to burst out laughing. "'Little jumpy there, Coleman,' Terrell teased. The sniper wrinkled his nose. "'Yeah, just a bit,' he admitted. "'Wasn't expecting it.' He got to his feet and walked back up to the truck, looking into the back seat. The dark blood smear across the window parted just enough to reveal a badly decomposed corpse in the back. "'Ah, oh, Christ! He's been baking for a month,' Coleman whined. "'This is gonna be ripe.' Coleman took the butt end of his rifle and smashed the driver's side window, shattering it completely. The stench hit him like a punch in the nose, worse than anything he'd smelled since the apocalypse began. He gagged as he drew his knife and leaned inside, carefully reaching around the driver's seat to stab the zombie in the head, the blade squelching in the gooey flesh. He pulled his shirt up over his mouth and nose, hoping to contain some of the stench. He contemplated for a moment thinking about reaching into the zombie's pants in hopes of finding a set of keys. He swallowed back another gag, knowing that it was his best chance to get the truck started. He groaned at the wet and pliable squishy body beneath the light pressure he was putting on it to get inside the pockets. Thankfully, the first one was the charm, and his finger poked into a keyring. These better be it, he grunted, and pulled them free, still wincing at the feel of the badly decomposed corpse. He shoved the key into the ignition and turned it with a silent prayer. The truck roared to life and he resisted breathing a sigh of relief, for fear of inhaling the disgusting stench. Watch yourselves, he called. Terrell and Dante got out of the way as Coleman backed the boat up to the water. The others secured it as it unloaded from the trailer, wrapping a rope from the front around one of the dock posts. We good? Coleman called, voice strained. Terrell held up his thumb. Yeah, we're good he said. The sniper threw the truck into park, shut it off, and bolted from the driver's seat, 
tearing about ten yards away before doubling over and taking in a breath. You gonna make it there, bud? Tyrell asked, raising an eyebrow. Coleman took in a few more deep, welcome breaths before waving him off and sauntering down the dock. The trio clambered into the boat and Tyrell pushed off of the wood and they began moving away from the bridge. We're still pretty close, the captain said. Let's give the current a little while to work before firing up the engine. Dante cocked his head. We're doing good on time, I take it? he asked. Still have an hour and fifteen, Tyrell replied. Coleman stretched out on the bench, crossing his boots at the ankles. All right, he drawled. You'll wake me when it's time to kick some ass. The captain chuckled, shaking his head and smirking at his partner. The trio stayed quiet as they floated down the water, enjoying the gentle bob of the boat and a brief moment of peace. Chapter 4 Ace drove Maddox, Lily and Tate towards the northern bridge where they assumed the zombies were coming from. Every quarter mile or so they had to stop to deal with another small batch of ghouls. Damn it, got three more, Ace muttered and slammed on the brakes, throwing the SUV into park. The others got out readying their melee weapons, Lily and Tate from the back. Maddox, however, bolted from the passenger seat and rushed the three ghouls who were fairly tight close together. He bowled them over with a shoulder bash, knocking them back, before wildly swinging his bat. He spent a lot of energy, letting out frustrated grunts with each hit. Within a matter of seconds, his wildness had pulverized all three skulls. He stared at them for a moment, his chest heaving, and then leaned over to wipe his bat clean on the grass before casually walking back to the vehicle. You know, you could save some for the rest of us, Tate joked, shaking his head, though his brow was furrowed in worry for his friend. Maddox clucked his tongue as he got back into his seat. Don't worry, with the way today is going. You'll have your chance, he quipped. Tate and Lily shared a glance, but Ace interrupted their moment by banging on the side of the car. Unless y'all are walking, you better get your asses back inside, he called. The two of them complied, jumping back into their seats, and he hit the gas, propelling them closer to the bridge, which was still a couple miles away. Sure as clockwork, when they came around a corner about a quarter mile up, they ran into another batch of ghouls, this time numbering about twenty. Well, buddy, you ain't shoulder bashing your way through that group, Tate said. Maddox growled. No, but I'm pretty sure I can take them. He snapped and opened his door. Tate lashed forward, grabbing his shoulder and holding him in his seat. I know you're pissed off, but you need to calm the fuck down, he said firmly. Maddox shook him off, but at least slammed his door shut again, crossing his arms. So, how do you want to take him out? Ace asked. Pass him by, Lily cut in. What? Her cousin asked, turning around to gape at her. Why? Because before we fight a group that size, I want to know what we're dealing with. She replied matter-of-factly. Ace glanced at Tate, who nodded in agreement. It made sense, after all. He punched the gas and sped towards the bridge, weaving in and out between small backs of zombies as they went. When they reached sight of the bridge, all four of them let out a collective gasp. What the hell? Francis? Ace cried. Two of the vehicles on the barricade had been smashed away from the line, creating a massive hole for zombies to come through. There were about a hundred ghouls between them and the bridge, half of which were on the road, but none within twenty yards of them at the moment, but coming their way. Why would he open it up like this? Ace moaned, putting a hand to his forehead. I don't think he had a choice, Lily said, pointing past him. Look just past the line. They all leaned forward at half a dozen ghouls flattened on the ground just past the line, as well as a few sprawled out just before it. Shit, Ace muttered. So this place was overrun when they got here? Knowing Francis like I do, Tate said slowly, he wasn't about to risk Bailey and the kids' lives to try and clear them out by hand. Lily took a deep breath. Question is, what do we do about it now? She asked. No way we can fix the barricade with all of those things. It's not difficult, Maddox snapped. We kill them all. Unless you have an arsenal, I'm not aware of, Ace replied. I don't see that as a viable option. Lily drew her bottom lip between her lips, shaking her head. 
cuz, you gotta get us out of here before we get surrounded, she warned. Where am I going? he asked. Neighborhood? she suggested. He shrugged. Fuck it, works for me, he muttered, and threw the SUV into gear, taking off and knocking down a few ghouls as they went. He rushed up to a turn off a few blocks away, turning into the small subdivision. There were some creatures roaming about, but nothing like it was on the main road. Get as far away from the main drag as we can, Tate said. Ace nodded. Last house, coming up, he said, and pulled into a driveway at the end of the road. The house was a small one-story starter home, but looked secure. Everyone got out of the vehicle, but Lily skidded to a stop behind Tate and Ace, when she realized Maddox stood by the back of the SUV. His shoulders were squared and he patted his bat into his palm, chin raised, casually waiting for descending zombies to get closer. Maddox! she barked. Tate grabbed her arm. Leave him be, he urged. She clenched her jaw. But the man's got some issues to work through, Tate cut in. We didn't pass enough of those things in the neighborhood to be a worry. Let him stand guard and stop bashing. She chewed her bottom lip as she looked at her ex watching him walk up to a lumbering creature and crack its skull with a single blow. He wandered back to his spot, leaning up against the back of the SUV like he was hanging out at a Saturday night barbecue. Ace opened the door, and Tate tugged on Lily, who reluctantly entered the house behind the boys. They did a quick sweep to make sure the place was empty, relieved to find that it was. The trio took up position in the living room to keep an eye on Maddox just in case he got in over his head. I know your boy is crazy, but this is pushing it to a new level, Ace said with a sigh. Tate shook his head. He'll be fine, he said. Besides, with what we're facing, it might be a good thing to have a lunatic on our side. Lily grunted, crossing her arms. Well, outside of giving him a six-pack of energy drinks and setting him loose, she drawled. You got any bright ideas on how to deal with this problem? So far, I think that's the best we got, Tate admitted dryly. Cuz, you got any more of those redneck contraption ideas like the sparkler bomb? She asked, turning to Ace. He shrugged. I'm sure I could figure out some way to make a fireball, he replied. But unless we get them all together, it ain't gonna do much good. She contemplated for a moment, looking out the window back towards the main road, where a few dozen zombies were already within view. She focused on a two-story house that ran up against a thick tree line about twenty yards away. You ever make a zip line? she asked. Ace raised an eyebrow. Yeah, I mean, it didn't work that well, he admitted, scratching the back of his head. Cracked two of Jimmy Taylor's ribs when we used it, but by God he got to the end of it. Why? Lily waved for them to approach the window, and when they reached her, she pointed to the house she'd been looking at. Think you can rig something up from that house to the trees? She asked. Ace shrugged. I guess, but why? He asked. You said you needed them bunched together, right? She asked. We get up to the second floor, bunch them up out front, set them on fire, then zip line out the back. Her cousin nodded thoughtfully. Yeah, that could work, he agreed. You're crazy, Tate exclaimed. Why wouldn't we just use a ladder instead? She shrugged. Because if those things come around the back, we're not going to want to land anywhere near them, she replied. He shook his head. Still think you're crazy, he declared. You got a better idea? She shot back. Tate paused. Well, no, he admitted. But how are we getting them to the house? Drive around and herd them like cattle, she suggested, motioning as she spoke. Bring them by the house and add them to the pack. Probably won't be able to get all of them, but should thin them out enough for us to get our job done. Maddox let out a yell outside, and they watched him dart forward and crack three skulls in quick succession, hooting and hollering all the way. Especially with the way he's getting after it, Lily said dryly. Ace and Tate exchanged a look and then shrugged. I ain't got nothing better, Ace said. His friend sighed. All right, he agreed. What do we need? I need some rope. The thicker the better, Ace said. And something to cut it with. For the bomb? Lily asked. Ace pointed to the back of the house. Dig through every cabinet and get me anything that looks even remotely flammable, he instructed, 
I'll make something work. Maddox yelled again, and the trio turned back to him as he celebrated another kill with wildfire in his eyes. Another twenty or so zombies slowly shambled up the road towards them. We'd better make it quick, Lily said. Let's move. Chapter 5 Tyrell's group landed the boat on the shore of Beaufort, finding a small bit of cover for it. The back half was still in the water, but it would at least be difficult to see unless someone was really looking for it. The trio knelt behind some brush in a rough circle, checking their weapons. We're a couple miles away from the base, so stay low, quiet, and move quick, Tyrell instructed softly. Patrols could be out. Anything between us and base? Dante asked. If memory serves, there are some off-base neighborhoods up ahead, the captain replied. I say we find us a safe house before tackling the base. Coleman nodded. We get separated, and we're gonna need a place to meet up. He agreed. Lead the way, then, Dante said, holding out a hand. Terrell led the trio through the brush towards the houses, quickly reaching a clearing. There was a row of homes about a hundred yards from their position, with the main road about half a mile past that. There was minimal movement around the structures, which was a good sign. They moved quickly, staying low and rushing across the wetland. Before long, they were at the back of the houses, with several zombies coming their way from both directions. Wait for them to get to us, Terrell said. We're going to have to stash them out of sight so we don't attract attention. Might as well let them do all the work. Coleman moved towards the back door of the house. In the meantime, though, he trailed off as he peered through the window of the one-story structure. There were no signs of a struggle, so he broke open the window pane on the door and reached in to unlock it. I'll clear this if you guys want to take care of them, he offered. Have at it, Terrell agreed, turning back towards the half-dozen or so creatures lumbering towards them. Dante took a deep breath. Don't know about you, but I'm real glad these things have slowed down, he said. Preaching to the choir, brother, the captain replied with a nod. Coleman and I started out in a mid-sized city. We were lucky as hell to get out alive. Some buddies of ours got shipped off to Charlotte. Dante let out a soft oof, shaking his head. Can't imagine what that was like, he said. Did they make it? Terrell nodded. Last time I heard, most of them were surviving, he replied. Been out of the loop for quite a while, though. Got separated from your squad? Dante asked. Yeah, and we really haven't made much of an effort to re-establish contact, the captain admitted. Really wasn't our intention, mind you. We didn't set out to be deserters, just ran into some people who could use our help, and things kind of snowballed from there. Figure as long as we're out here killing zombies, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Two ghouls approached, one on each side, arms outstretched. Well, if you need a witness at your court-martial hearing... Dante said, stepping forward to smack down a zombie on his side. I'm happy to lend my voice to your cause. Terrell laughed as he brained the corpse on his side. I appreciate it, he said. Guess that gives me more incentive to keep you alive, huh? You mean that wasn't on your agenda already? Dante grunted as he struck down the third zombie, sending it sliding across the grass. Yeah, it was, Terrell said as he swung at the fourth, knocking it lifeless as they waited for the last two to get within range. But it's like adding another spoonful of sprinkles onto a Sunday. A little more never hurts. They stepped forward in unison to kill the last two creatures, and then set to work dragging the six bodies to the wall of the house to keep them out of sight. Coleman poked his head out from the back door. We're good in here, he said, waving them in. Once Terrell and Dante were finished with their job, they headed inside, finding Coleman by the front window. The trio could barely see the main road from there, having to look past the next two rows of houses. Coleman, you're on patrol watch, Terrell instructed. See if anything goes by, and what direction they're headed. The sniper nodded. On it, Cap, he said. How are we doing on time? Dante asked. Terrell checked his watch. Forty-five minutes until we're supposed to be on base, he said. So, we'll give the patrol watching ten, and then we'll take off. Dante nodded and then walked into the kitchen, checking the pantry for anything useful before finding a lone bottle of water. He cracked it open and took a seat at the kitchen table, trying to send to himself before the raid began. He was a bit out of his depth, but this had to happen, if they were going to get Grace back. He let visions of her smile and her affectionate eyes float through his mind, letting that drive him, 
Fuel him. Give him strength. Chapter 6 Maddox stood outside the two-story house, occasionally smacking down a ghoul that wandered up to him. He was doing his best to stay quiet, as were the others, to prevent them from being overrun before they were ready. On the second floor of the house, Ace secured a long, thick rope to a bedpost and ran it to a door for extra stability. He tossed the other end out of the window, where Tate waited below. "'Get it to one of those trees, about eight feet off of the ground,' Ace called. "'Make it as tight as you can.' Tate gave him a thumbs up before grabbing the end of the rope and running off. Lily entered the room as Ace turned away from the window, and she held out a large butcher knife. "'Sharpest thing I could find in the kitchen,' she said. "'That'll work,' her cousin replied. "'Cut off a couple of three-foot lengths and sent them on the bed.' Lily raised an eyebrow. "'What's this for?' she asked. "'I don't have time to rig up a pulley,' he replied. "'So we're going to have to use rope.' She took a deep breath. "'Is that gonna work, cuz?' she asked. He shrugged. "'Gonna hurt like a bitch on the hands,' he admitted. "'But should be okay.' "'You good on the explosives?' she asked. Ace nodded with a grin. Oh yeah, I'm gonna burn this bitch down when you get him up here, he declared. As soon as Tate gets your escape route secured, we'll head out, she replied with a firm nod as she soared through some chunks of rope. You taking Maddox? her cousin asked. Lily shook her head. No, I figured he would be better utilized staying here and covering the ground floor, she replied, if any of those things get inside. Yeah, it'll be good to have him. Ace agreed. But don't go pretending like you wouldn't rather pawn him off on me than deal with him yourself. She rolled her eyes. Even before Tegan, I'd want to pawn him off on you. She drawled. But now, in his state? She raised a hand. Doubly so. It's all good, Lil. Just busting your balls, he replied with a smirk. The rope went taut and Ace flicked it a few times, nodding at how tight it was, creating a viable escape route. He leaned out the window and gave Tate a thumbs up. Guess that's my cue, Lily said, taking a deep breath. We'll be back, with company. We'll be here, Ace replied. You just be ready to pick us up. She nodded. There's a four-wheeler trail at the end of the road that'll take us back to the main road. We'll pick you up there. Happy hunting, Lil, he said, clapping her on the shoulder. She grinned. Happy barbecuing, cuz, she replied. He winked at her and she poked his arm before heading downstairs and through the front door. Maddox reeled back and caved in the head of yet another zombie, not even noticing her approach. You ain't getting tired yet, are you? Lily asked, crossing her arms. He shrugged and spread his hands. I can do this all day, he declared. That's good, because we're bringing them your way, she said. He clucked his tongue. Leaving me here, huh? He drawled. Ace is going to need someone to cover his ass, which in this case means covering the first floor, Lily replied, jerking a thumb over her shoulder. You good with that? Maddox nodded, wiggling his bat for effect. If anything tries to get in, they'll regret it, he promised. Okay then, she replied, and debated about saying more. She felt like there had to be something she could say to help him even a little with his current mental state. But she didn't have the words. Before she could awkwardly force something out, Tate came around the corner of the house. You ready? he asked. She nodded and pointed at Maddox firmly. You don't let anything happen to my cuz, or you and I are going to have some words, she warned. He didn't reply, simply headed inside, and Tate and Lily got into the SUV. Was that necessary? he asked, voice tight as he started up the vehicle. She shrugged. It's how I'd normally treat him, so yeah, I think it was, she replied. Kid Gloves ain't bringing him back to normal, so maybe normal will. He sighed, seemingly unconvinced, but backed out of the driveway all the same, focusing on the dangerous task at hand. They peeled out and Lily heard Maddox smack the barrel top of his metal bat onto the concrete walkway, sending a metallic echo through the air. Tate drove up the main road, zombie packs in both directions. Where to first? he asked, looking both ways. Away from the bridge, Lily instructed. That four-wheeler trail will take us around to the bridge, so we can just do a big circle. He nodded and followed her directions, driving up about half a mile and passing by a few dozen zombies in the process. 
He spun the vehicle around and drove slowly back, weaving in and out between the groups, making sure that the ghouls could keep up. Within a few minutes they had quite the group following them. As they approached the turnoff, another large group appeared in the road coming towards them. Better speed it up, Lily suggested. Don't want to run into them. Tate picked up some speed and made the turn down the street, laying on the horn as he went. They blew by the house towards the trail, Maddox standing outside and giving them a friendly wave with his bat. Maddox watched as the SUV vanished on the trail before turning his attention towards the zombies coming his way. At first it looked like a few dozen, but it didn't take long for the number to approach a hundred. He continued to stand there, dropping the head of his bat onto the front walk, the sound progressively being drowned out by the chorus of moans growing more and more excited at the prospect of a fresh meal. When the front edge of the mob reached the yard, Maddox finally retreated inside and locked the door. He paused for a moment and then shoved a couch up against it before standing ready for battle. The mob swarmed to the front of the house, stretching out from the door to the outer wall, covering the entirety of the living room windows. Normally, having a giant bay window would be a lovely addition to a house, but not when it came to zombie defense. He watched as they pressed up against the glass, the window stretching down to only a few feet off of the ground, giving the creatures plenty of leverage. As they moaned and pounded against it, Ace called down from the top of the stairs. "'Where we at, bro?' he asked. "'They're doing another lap,' Maddox called back. "'Just sit tight.' "'You need a hand?' Ace yelled. "'Nah, I'm good,' Maddox replied, gripping the bat tightly. He stared at the front window, just waiting for it to break apart. It wasn't long before cracks began to form, the shinks echoing throughout the room. The rednecks stared at the zombies on the other side, surveying the lifeless eyes and decaying faces pressed up against the glass. Jaws black with aged, rotted blood as they gnashed at the window. It finally imploded, glass shattering and moans echoed throughout the house. Ace tore halfway down the stairs, eyes wide with shock at the five-foot-wide gap in the house, with zombies crawling in. Holy shit! he cried. I got this! Maddox barked, whirling around at him with anger in his eyes. Get those firebombs ready! Ace stood there, gaping at the scene before him. Maddox leapt into action, smacking zombies in the head, caving in skulls. One creature pulled itself up, propelled by a corpse pushing behind it and flopped into the living room proper. Maddox spun around, swinging the bat hard and catching it in the chest, sending it tumbling right back out the window where it had come in. He glanced back over his shoulder, growling at Ace, who was still stock still on the stairs. Go! he bellowed. Now! Ace finally snapped back to it and turned tail, tearing back up the stairs to continue working on the firebombs. Maddox stood fast, delivering blow after blow to the creatures, keeping them from getting inside the broken bay window. As he did so, the wooden door frame began to creak and crack under the pressure of the zombies outside, and on the other side he could hear ghouls smacking up against the regular-sized windows. The SUV appeared out front, giving a honk over the horn, and Maddox leaned as close as he dared to the window, giving a worried-looking Lily a thumbs up and waving them on. The vehicle hesitated for a moment, and then finally left, Tate succumbing to his wishes. Maddox beat down a couple more zombies in the window before the front door gave way, the couch in front of it providing very little in the way of resistance. As the couch slid back, he stepped up and cracked the lead ghoul's head open, but it did little to prevent the door from continuing to open. He backed up a bit, getting a few steps up on the stairs and squared his shoulders, holding his position. The noise in the living room was tremendous, with breaking glass and crunching wood occasionally popping off over the excited moans of the ghouls. The first zombie, what used to be a teenage boy no more than fifteen, reached the stairs. Maddox didn't hesitate before bringing his bat down hard on top of its head. As it crumpled to the ground, several more stepped up into its place. He continued to swing wildly, taking down ghoul after ghoul but being forced to continue moving back up the stairs as the living room filled up with zombies. When he got halfway up, Ace appeared at the top of the stairs holding a large glass bottle with a rag tucked in it. Get up here, boy, he bellowed. Maddox delivered a forceful front kick to the lead ghoul, sending several of them falling back onto the others and buying him a few seconds to scurry up the stairs. As soon as he was up there, Ace lit up the rag. 
Get to the bedroom in the back and get your ass down that zip line, he barked, and Maddox nodded, taking off as instructed. Ace chucked the Molotov at the feet of the creatures. It broke open, and flaming liquid quickly engulfed the stairwell and the ghouls on it. He ran to the front bedroom that overlooked the front yard and picked up two large bottles. He lit them both and hurled them both out the window, down towards the mob that now covered half of the front yard. They shattered on impact, catching a couple dozen of the few hundred zombies on fire. As the flames spread out a bit, he reached down and picked up a five-gallon bucket filled with liquid. The pungent scent hit his nostrils of the rancid mix of alcohol, household cleaner, and anything else flammable that Lily had found. Ace took a couple of steps back, getting the bucket secured in his hands before darting forward. He threw the liquid with everything he had, sending it splashing down onto the fire below. The fireball was spectacular, reaching back up to the second floor where he was. Once it was clear, he poked his head outside to see that half of the front yard was covered in fire. Yeah, cuck you bastards! Ace bellowed and turned to run to the zip line. He stopped short, eyes widening at the sight of a flaming zombie in the doorway. Shit! He didn't think, simply reacted, running hard towards the creature. When he got close, he leapt into the air, extending his leg forward and delivering the most awkward front kick ever delivered. It did the trick, however, as it created an opening just wide enough for him to squeeze through. The smoke began to fill the upstairs hallway as Ace rushed to the back bedroom. He reached the door and turned around, seeing a vision of hell. Smoke, fire, and flaming corpses staggering towards him. He hesitated a moment before slamming the door shut. He looked around the room, finally finding the rope segment from the bed and rushed over to the window. He took in a deep, lungful of clean air and then threw the rope over the makeshift zipline. He climbed onto the windowsill, sitting for a moment as the flaming ghouls banged on the door. This shit is a lot more fun when I'm watching others do it, he muttered, and then pushed off of the window, holding tightly to the rope. It slid along the zipline well, but holding onto it made his palms scream, the bumpiness putting strain on his shoulders. He screamed as he came in hot towards the tree, forcing himself to let go a few yards from impact. Maddox was there to catch him doing a good enough job of being a cushion so that Ace didn't shatter his legs on impact. Both men toppled to the grass and Ace flopped onto his back, chest heaving. Holy shit, that was a hell of a ride, he gasped. It was something else, Maddox agreed, sitting up to look at the house. Smoke billowed from the windows, thankfully no zombies coming back around. Come on, Ace huffed as he hauled himself to his feet. We gotta get moving, catch up to Lil and Tate so we can get that bridge secure. Maddox nodded and took his proffered hand, and the two of them jogged off towards the meet-up spot at the trail. Chapter 7 Terrell, Coleman, and Dante moved through the neighborhood before taking cover in the trees and tall grass that ran parallel to the main road. They eventually worked their way to within sight of the base entrance, which was about a quarter mile away, taking cover just off the main road. Terrell used his rifle scope to look at the front entrance where two guards patrolled the gate. Got two by the front, he murmured. Coleman sighed. Can we go around? he whispered. Terrell looked again at the tall fence running along the perimeter of the base. There was nothing but wide open space between them and the base. He shook his head. It's no good, he replied. As soon as we break cover, we'll be exposed. I think we're going to have to take them out. Dante grunted softly. At least make damn sure neither of them are tall and bald, he suggested. I know the note said to be ready for a fight, but it would defeat the purpose if we kill the person we're up here to see. Terrell took another long look at the guards, noting their short statures and full heads of hair. Neither is our man, he said. What's the plan after we snipe them? Coleman asked. Your guess is as good as mine, the captain replied dryly. His partner sighed again. Not really the answer I was hoping for there, Cap, he said as he checked his rifle. I don't know where this dude is going to be, Terrell explained. So I guess we can start out with the main command center. If memory serves, it's on the northern side of the base, open to suggestions, though. Coleman nodded. Sounds good to me, he agreed. Dante? I'm just along for the ride, Dante said, raising a hand. Lead on. 
The soldiers got into firing position, aiming their assault rifles at the guards. On my mark, Terrell said quietly. Three, two, one. Both of them fired at the same moment, dropping the two guards like synchronized dancers. The echo of the shots rang in the air as the three of them broke cover and sprinted across the open area to the base. As they approached the door, it was clear the guards were down for good. The soldiers each grabbed one, dragging them off of the centre of the road to some light cover. Not perfect, Terrell grunted as he jogged back over, but they won't be able to spot them from a distance. He led the group into the base, making a turn towards the north. There were a dozen smaller buildings and a few mid-sized ones in front of them, with roads going between them, like a small neighbourhood. The group rushed up to the first one, and Terrell peered inside. There wasn't any movement in there, and when his eyes adjusted to the dim light, he could make out a pile of corpses. Body dump, he murmured. The trio worked their way through the smaller buildings, glancing inside and finding nothing of use. In the distance, a vehicle engine roared, and they took cover against the wall of a structure to stay out of sight. Terrell peeked around the corner, looking in the direction of the noise, seeing an SUV roll by in the direction of the front gate. We're about to be made, he muttered. Shit, that was quick, Coleman said dryly, clenching his jaw. Should we take them out too? Dante asked. The soldiers exchanged a look that clearly showed them thinking about it, but then both shook their heads. We don't know their numbers, Tyrell said quietly. If we go popping off again, it could be a bad day for us. The other two nodded in agreement, and the captain kept them moving away from the front. When they reached the edge of the smaller buildings, there was a large road before they reached the mid-sized ones. They looked like storage warehouses with lots of windows showing off crates inside. As Terrell set foot on the road, another engine roared. Move, move, he hissed, and took off running. Coleman was hot on his heels, running a bit faster than Dante, and both soldiers reached the building across the way as the SUV tore around the corner. Dante was a few steps away from the entrance when gunshots rang out. The bullets hit the ground beside his feet as he dove towards the door. He dropped his bat and staggered inside as shots continued to pepper the air bullets impacting the metal walls of the building. Dante made it inside and bolted to the right, taking cover behind a stack of large wooden crates. A thought dawned on him, and he peeked up at the others. I don't think they saw you, he called. Stay down, I got this. He took a deep breath as he looked around, the gunfire still going. The building was fairly large, with several rows of crates and other goods. He scanned the forty yards between him and the side wall, spotting a door from his vantage point. He moved back a couple of rows as the gunfire finally stopped, near deafening in the sudden silence. Dante slipped through the crates to get closer to the wall, straining his ears for any noise. The bullet-ridden door creaked open and he crept up to the front of the building, about thirty yards away. Two armed men came inside, guns raised, each of them going in different directions. Dante took a deep breath, psyching himself up. Things were about to get hairy. Over here, assholes, he yelled, and then ducked behind cover as one man fired a few shots in his direction. Dante raced towards the door he'd spotted as the two men pursued him. He managed to get to the door and through it just before they turned the corner at the end of the row. He busted out into the open, running across a twenty-yard area to the next building. Be unlocked, he thought, chanting the words in his head like a prayer. Please be unlocked. To his relief, it was and he burst inside, pressing himself up against the wall just beside the door to lay in wait. He pulled out his handgun, holding it tightly in one hand, peeking through a crack in the door. He watched the two men approach, assault rifles raised. He clenched his jaw when he realized they were both clad in full-body armor. Headshots or nothing, I guess, he thought bitterly, and readied himself. When they reached the door, they paused before entering and then the lead man pulled it towards him, throwing it open with a loud bang. Dante struck, stepping close and grabbing the assault rifle barrel and shoving it aside. Several rounds went harmlessly into the wall, but the guard's partner tried to aim at the surprise attack. Dante hid behind the guard he'd shoved, raising his gun over his human shield shoulder to fire. The first bullet hit the man in the chest, dropping him to one knee from the impact, but the second managed to catch him in the throat, cutting past that body armour and sending a spurt of blood onto the ground. The mercenary in his grip let go of his rifle completely and swung at Dante, 
who blunted the blow a little by raising his arm into a defensive position. The impact of the punch, however, caused him to drop the gun. In the same motion, Dante raised his handgun to fire, but the mercenary managed to push it out of the way, causing him to fire off into the building. The guard struck Dante's arm, sending the handgun clattering to the floor, but he countered with a chest strike. The impact was blunted by the body armor, but still drove the mercenary back a step. I don't think I have to tell you, the mercenary grunted, but you fucked up royally by coming here. Dante smirked. Well, I've already turned your friend there into a bloody mess, he drawled. What makes you think I won't do the same to you? His opponent spared a look for his dead comrade, shaking his head. Anybody can get off a lucky shot, he snarled, and drew his knife. But it's going to take a lot more than that for you to prevent me from carving you up. If I didn't know better, I'd swear you were stalling, Dante teased, raising his eyebrow in a show of bravado. You waiting on backup or something? The mercenary sneered. Only because I don't want to move your corpse on my own, he said, and lunged forward with the knife. Dante easily smacked his hand away, but the mercenary simply smirked, bouncing from foot to foot as if he were excited by the confrontation. He slashed again, but Dante leapt out of the way deftly. You got a little skill, I can appreciate that, the mercenary commended. Dante winked at him. Let's see if you still appreciate it when I jam that knife into your throat, he offered. The mercenary lunged forward with a series of slashes. Dante managed to dodge and deflect most of them, except for the final one, which sliced his arm. They stepped back for a moment and he inspected the wound, giving a little shrug as he poked it with a smile. "'Tis but a scratch,' he declared. The mercenary growled. "'Okay, playtime is over,' he snapped, and rushed forward, straight jabbing at Dante's chest. He flung himself backwards, grabbing his attacker's wrist, leaping and securing his legs around the man's arm in a difficult MMA manoeuvre. He landed with a thud on his back, dragging the mercenary to the floor with him, his arms secure in a painful hold. The mercenary thrashed about, trying to break free of the extreme pain, but Dante didn't let up. Within seconds, the knife clattered along the floor, and Dante exerted as much pressure as possible on the arm. The snap of bone echoed throughout the cavernous building, quickly followed by a blood-curdling scream. Dante let go, grabbing the knife and popping up over his opponent's chest. The mercenary raised his sidearm, but Dante managed to get the tip of the knife to the throat before he could get his hand too far off the ground. Might be in your best interest to drop it, he growled in warning. The mercenary contemplated for a moment, his breath shallow as if he were trying to avoid the blade. Dante stared at him intently with his lone eye, the gun in his periphery. The guard made a sudden motion with his gun hand, but Dante drove the knife into his throat quickly, lashing out with his other hand to knock the weapon out of the way. The mercenary convulsed on the ground, finally going limp. Dante picked himself up off of the ground, snatching the handgun as he moved. He walked back over to the door to collect his own weapon and the assault rifle, and peeked out to see three more mercenaries rushing towards him, guns raised. He thanked the heavens for the fact that it was bright outside and dimly lit inside, providing himself with just enough cover to not have been shot at already. He immediately broke out into a sprint, rushing through the somewhat empty warehouse towards the outer wall. When he was halfway across the room, he ducked behind a crate, knowing that the other mercenaries were hot on his trail. There was a crackle as one of them spoke into a walkie-talkie. Commander, we have two down in warehouse number three, the mercenary reported. Hostile still at large. Continue search, somebody replied through the speaker. Dante peeked out from behind cover, looking at the trio of armed men starting to look around for him, spreading out. When the man in the center started to walk, his boot hit the body on the floor, and he looked down at the rapidly bleeding out body. We got a live one, the mercenary exclaimed. The other two rushed over to him, the trio of them clustering around the fallen man. In his last moments of life, he pointed weakly towards Dante, causing all three of them to turn. He dove back behind cover, but it was too late, and bullets peppered the crates he'd been hiding behind. He blindly fired back, not sure or caring if he hit anything. This forced them back behind cover, and gave him a chance to run for the far door. The back-and-forth firing continued as he made a break for the exit, finally getting there and through to the other side. 
He looked around for where to go, concern rising in him at being almost out of ammo. He opted to run back towards the front gate, hoping that by keeping these guys occupied that the others could get to the bald guy. Dante ran hard, getting to the first small building just as his pursuers emerged from the warehouse. He lowered his shoulder, smashing into the door as bullets flew, hitting the walls of the building. His forceful blow knocked the door open, allowing him to get inside, though he hit the floor hard. He kicked at the door while crawling along the ground, bullets smacking into the outer walls and sending glass and debris everywhere. They're going to flank me if I don't hurry, he thought frantically, and scrambled to his feet, risking getting shot while popping off a couple of blind shots towards them. He ran to the other side of the building, managing to get to the door and throw it open, finding a mercenary just reaching for the doorknob. Dante caught him by surprise, and he lowered his shoulder and slammed it into the man's midsection, driving him hard into the ground. The impact knocked the wind out of him, giving Dante a chance to get back up, grab the assault rifle, and aim it at his opponent's head. Remember, I spared you, he said firmly, and the mercenary held his hands up high as he struggled to catch his breath. Dante kept the gun trained on him until he moved around the corner, vanishing out of sight. He turned and ran as hard as he could, carrying the assault rifle with him. He wove in between buildings, cutting across the rows to make it harder to find. Footsteps echoed behind him as he raced towards the front gate. He didn't know if there was enough distance between him and the trailing mercenaries to make it to the gate, but he didn't have a choice. He broke away from the last building, sprinting as hard as he could towards the gate. When he got close, he wove back and forth a bit just before gunshots went off. They whizzed by him, the sound and disturbed air fleeting by his face, and he dove for cover behind the front guard post. He turned and spotted two mercenaries at the edge of the buildings, aiming his way. He readied the assault rifle, raising it and firing in three round bursts. He wasn't very accurate, but enough to hit the building they were hiding behind and force them back behind cover. Dante fired another burst before picking himself up and tearing towards the tree line. It was a long distance of no cover, but he put his head down and ran, hoping that his last barrage would keep him hiding for a few moments. Much to his surprise, he reached the trees sliding down behind them. He turned quickly and aimed the rifle back towards the gate, seeing two mercenaries taking up position there. They were too far away to hear, but he could see them talking into the communicator. A shot went off in the distance, gaining their attention, and they seemed to still be talking rapidly into their device. A few moments later, both took off running towards the south end of the base. Dante slid further into the trees, taking a few moments to collect himself. He rested his head against the grass, closing his eyes, basking in how lucky he was to still be alive. Hope you boys are okay, he thought, prayed, and really hope you find who we're after. He got up and headed back towards the safe house, making sure to stay as far away from the main road as possible, assuming that patrols would be in full force and looking specifically for him. Chapter 8 Coleman and Terrell took cover behind some crates as gunfire started up again outside. They looked over at Dante scurrying inside, going in the opposite direction. Shit! How are we getting to him? The captain whispered. Coleman simply shook his head as the two of them readied their weapons. Before they could do anything, Dante let out a whistle. I don't think they saw you, he called. Stay down, I got this. They exchanged a worried look, but knew it would be smartest to honor his request. They backed down, listening hard as their companion lured the two mercenaries away. Finally, the door on the opposite wall slammed shut, leaving them alone. That boy better live. Or Lily's gonna murder me, Terrell muttered. Coleman smirked. Pretty sure she could, too, he quipped. Terrell chuckled and nodded, not bothering to refute the opinion that could very easily be a fact. He motioned for his partner to follow him as they worked their way towards another exit from the building. When they reached the door, he cracked it open and peered outside. There was another large building about twenty yards to the north of them. Command center should be on the other side of that building. Terrell murmured. Coleman nodded. Then we just gotta hope our man is there, he replied. A couple of gunshots went off in the distance, and Terrell tongued his cheek. If he's not, we can probably just hang out and wait for his arrival, he said. At least we know Dante's putting up a fight, Coleman said dryly. 
Terrell held up a hand and then led them out of the building, sprinting to the next one. They burst inside and hunkered down, taking cover at the sound of footsteps. The captain peered through the crack in the door, watching three men rushing towards Dante's position. Coleman stiffened, but Terrell shook his head. He knew the scarred man could handle himself. Once the footsteps settled down, the duo got up and made their way through the warehouse. They didn't run, opting to move quietly and carefully with their guns raised and at the ready. The warehouse was filled with crates and vehicles, looking like more of a catch-all for the base. As they approached the other side of the building, a couple of voices echoed, prompting them to brace to strike. The chatter was unintelligible, but they could hear a communicator clicking on and off. The two soldiers split up so they could flank the men as they moved. As Terrell crept closer, he could finally make out what they were saying. Commander, want us to go help? One of them asked. Nah, he says they can handle it, his partner replied. We need to keep doing inventory. Who would be dumb enough to try and sneak into this place? The first one scoffed. People get desperate, the second one replied. You never know what they will do. Terrell stepped out from behind cover, aiming his assault rifle. You are right about that, man, he drawled. The mercenaries were startled, reaching for their weapons, but Coleman flanked them, popping out from behind cover with his rifle raised. Wouldn't be in your best interest to do that, boys, he warned. The two men raised their hands in defeat, and Coleman stepped forward to relieve them of their weapons. What do you want to do with them, Cap? he asked. Terrell contemplated for a moment before looking around. He spotted a metal support beam that went from the floor to the roof, and he motioned for them to go that way. As the mercenaries moved slowly, he looked around, finding a basket of zip ties on the wall, used to secure payloads before shipping out. Get some of that and let's tie these boys up, the captain instructed. Coleman cocked his head. You not worried they'll get out? he asked. Nah, these are fine, upstanding young men who would never attempt to escape, Terrell said, poking one of them with the barrel of his gun. Am I right? The two mercenaries nodded furiously and took a seat next to the pole. Coleman grabbed a handful of zip ties and walked over, using the material to tie them up and secure them to the pole. Base commander is going to make you wish you never came here, one of them muttered. Well, let's not delay the introduction then, Terrell said firmly. He in the command center up there? The mercenary blinked at him. Oh, uh, he stammered, shaking his head. Yeah, I think so. Good, because I got a score to settle with him, Terrell said and pulled out his knife, using it to cut a large portion of the mercenary's shirt off. He balled it up and shoved it in their mouths, with Coleman using a bit more of the zip ties to make sure they couldn't spit it out. You boys hang tight now, Terrell said. Somebody will find you eventually. They both slumped against the pole, looking defeated. The soldiers headed for the door, stopping to look out and make sure nobody else was around. Maybe I'm out of line here, Coleman murmured, but shouldn't we have just shot those two? Terrell sighed. Normally I'd say yeah, he replied slowly, but the base is under attack and they were told to keep doing inventory. I don't think they're very high up on the food chain. Just wouldn't feel right killing a non-combatant. Coleman paused and then nodded in agreement. More gunshots went off in the distance, signaling that Dante was still at it, and the soldiers shared a glance. Come on, let's go find our man before we lose the chance, Terrell said and they burst out of the warehouse, rushing across the open area to the command centre. They didn't have much time, so after a quick cursory glance revealing an office set up with not much else, they went inside to avoid being spotted. Coleman shut the door gently behind them, and Terrell went into sentry mode. He scanned the room, the sunlight illuminating it pretty well, but still with some deep shadows that made it hard to see. The captain motioned for Coleman to follow him up the centre aisle through the cubicles, about halfway up, the cold barrel of a gun pressed against Coleman's head. Shit, he muttered. Shit's right, boy, the mercenary drawled. He just stepped in it. Terrell swung around, aiming his weapon at their attacker. Let me be very clear about this, he said, eyes blazing. You pull that trigger, and it'll be the last thing you ever do. You sure about that? the mercenary asked smugly. A large, bald man stepped out from a cubicle, aiming an assault rifle at Terrell, leaving them in a tense standoff. Feel like I'm in one of those old spaghetti western films, Terrell drawled. Big time standoff. No name cocked his head. 
You'll have to forgive the lack of tumbleweeds, he said. No worries. Not really a whole lot of them in this part of the country anyway, the captain replied with a small shrug. Will you just shoot this motherfucker so we can be done with it? The other mercenary snapped. That anxious to die, are you? Terrell asked, raising an eyebrow. The mercenary sneered. I don't think you have the goods to hit me from there, he said. You sure about that? Terrell asked. You know, Delta, I thought we had an understanding on that bridge that you wouldn't come here, No Name said loudly, and his partner visibly withered at the sound of Delta. What can I say? Terrell asked with a sheepish shrug. I've been away from my unit for nearly a month now, so I've slacked off on the whole following orders thing. The bold mercenary shook his head. Not like Delta to slack off on their duty, he said. Well, these are strange times, Terrell replied. Nothing catches me by surprise anymore. If you don't shoot this asshole, then I will, the other mercenary shrieked. You will do no such thing, No Name said firmly. This situation needs to be de-escalated. I, for one, am all for that, Coleman quipped. His assailant pressed the gun harder against his head. Charlie, get over here, No Name demanded. Are you crazy? The mercenary snapped. As soon as I stand up, he's going to shoot me. No Name shook his head. He won't, he said firmly. I have your word, right? My red line is him pulling the trigger, Terrell replied. As long as he doesn't do that, your man's got nothing to worry about. What the hell is wrong with you? Charlie cried. Mosley and Theo are going to have a field day with you once I tell them you're backing down. Especially to the people who are out there killing our men. They're going to have your ass in a sling. No name regarded him with a cool gaze. If you're done ranting, now would be a good time to follow my orders, he said. Charlie begrudgingly got up from his spot, removing the gun barrel from Coleman's head. He looked back at No Name and made sure he had Terrell covered, and lowered his weapon to his side to make his way over to his superior. You're lucky the bald douche over there is such a puss. A three-round burst went off, ripping through Charlie's head and neck, dropping him to the ground. Coleman rolled out of harm's way immediately, and Terrell stayed tense as well, unsure of how to read the situation. No Name lowered his rifle. If anybody asks, you shot him, he said dryly. Terrell nodded. Not that I'm in the habit of taking credit for other people's kills, but I'll make an exception in this case, he said. I appreciate that, the bold mercenary said, and then his communicator beeped. Sir, is everything okay? Someone asked through the speaker. We heard gunshots in your direction. No name took a deep breath and then spoke quickly. We got a shooter at the command center, last seen headed south. His voice sounded out of breath and rushed. We'll cut him off before he escapes, sir, came the reply. I want you to set up patrols on the southern half of the base, No Name instructed. I put the fear of God in him. He won't be coming back this way. Yes, sir, the mercenary replied. No Name let go of the communicator, his expression softening before he turned back to the soldiers. That should buy us a few minutes, he said, no longer sounding out of breath. Follow me. He led them towards the back of the building at a brisk pace. So you came down here to help Dante get his sister out of danger, huh? He asked. Yeah, figured it was the right thing to do, Terrell replied. Is he with you? No Name asked. The captain nodded. Yeah, he's the one causing the ruckus out there, he replied. He's a tough son of a bitch, No Name said, shaking his head. Just like his sister. Terrell took a deep breath. No doubt, he said. But man, I got a question for you. Go ahead, the bold mercenary said as he opened the door to his office. Why in the hell did you bring us out here? Terrell asked as he entered, stepping aside for Coleman to follow. Wasn't there an easier way to get information to us? No name shook his head. Unfortunately not, he replied. The man I shot. You mean the man I shot? Terrell cut in playfully. No name smirked. Yeah, him, he agreed. Him and his CO were on to us about helping Grace and the others. He's been a shadow for the last week or so, making it all but impossible to do anything outside the norm. You got a note to us, Coleman piped up. Why not just tell us there? No name shook his head again. Civilian VIP, former football player, been helping us out with some things, he explained. Got him and his friend on our side, but we couldn't get him all the info he needed. Plus, his window to deliver that note was incredibly small. 
Understandable, given the circumstances, Terrell said. Sorry we had to wipe out so many of your men. No name waved him off. It's not your fault, he replied. I understand fully that we're the bad guys in this scenario, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing. He led them over to a desk, reaching inside a drawer to pull out a small satellite printout of the area by Hilton Head. He motioned along the map as he spoke, pointing to Harbour Town first. This is our base of operations, he began. In better times, it was a playground for the ultra-wealthy, now a hardened facility. Wouldn't be the first hardened facility we've infiltrated, Coleman muttered. No name smirked. Of that, I have no doubt, he said. But how many of those hardened facilities have you successfully extracted half a dozen civilians from without raising alarms? Terrell glanced at Coleman, and they stared at each other for a moment before the captain shrugged and his partner gave a conciliatory nod. So, if we're not extracting them, Coleman said slowly, what's the play? No name pointed to the island just to the west of Harbortown. We've had the group run operations on this island before, extracting personal items for VIPs. Luckily, we haven't lost anybody to the island yet, because it's infested. So why bring it up? Coleman asked. Since there are several civilian vessels scattered on the shoreline, we have patrol boats keeping a close eye on the waterways. No name explained. Which adds more complication to this plan. Terrell pursed his lips. So much for swimming to freedom, he murmured. Luckily, we have a boat, and a couple of people willing to risk their well-being to get your friends off of the island. No name replied. Locals? Terrell asked, raising an eyebrow. The bold mercenary shook his head. One of them is Kenny, the football player, he explained. The other is a colorful character named Captain Nico. Where did you dig him up at? Coleman asked. No name hesitated. Well, he trailed off for a moment. He's kind of an arms dealer. Been friends with Theo Atkinson for years. He showed up to the island a few days ago with Kenny. So this whole operation hinges on an arms dealer doing the right thing? Terrell asked, skepticism clear in his tone. Yeah, I know how it sounds, No Name said. Are you sure? Coleman asked, crossing his arms. Because you still pitched it to us with a straight face. The bold mercenary sighed. Again, I'm not blind to the absurdity of the situation surrounding Nico, but I'm also not blind to what's on the horizon for Grace and the others, he said firmly. We've cleared just about every area that we're going to clear. Defenses are in place, resources have been secured, so their usefulness is quickly diminishing. And let me tell you, those who have been deemed not useful don't have a good time. Execution? Terrell asked. No name shook his head. Entertainment, he said, as if the word tasted bad on his tongue. Think gladiator battles, but with zombies. You work for some fine people there, Terrell said dryly. If you wanted to know why I was talking with you, there you have it. No name replied. Pretty good reason to switch sides, Coleman agreed. I signed up for a lot of different reasons, No name said with a sigh. Civilian versus zombie gladiator battles wasn't among them. Terrell took a deep breath. So you get them to Nico's boat and past the patrols. Then what? he asked. Doesn't sound like the island is going to work as an extraction point. Why not just head out to sea and meet up thirty or forty miles away? Coleman suggested. No name shook his head. That's no good, he said. As soon as someone notices the VIPs aren't where they're supposed to be, the alarm is going to go out. Won't take them long to figure out they were on the boat. They still have helicopters operational, and they wouldn't hesitate to blow them out of the water. So, what do you suggest? Terrell asked. The bald man traced his finger along the map of the southwest of the island, tapping on a small patch of green a couple of miles away. You can't tell it from this map, but there's an old plantation house that sits here, just west of Palmetto Bluff, he explained. It's isolated, but has driveway connections to two main roads. It's only a couple miles away from shore, so we should be able to make it there pretty easily. We? Coleman asked, raising an eyebrow. No name nodded. Myself and my second-in-command, Kemp, he replied. We're already under the microscope, and with them all dead, our time is already short. Civilians get away, and Theo won't hesitate to put us down. Or worse. He shook his head, leaning on the desk. I don't know what your plan is after you get them out, 
and I'm not asking. Once we survive this, if you want us to go our separate ways, we will. But the only way this happens is with us along for the ride. Fair enough, Tyrell replied with a shrug. And, to be honest, we don't have much of a plan after extraction. Well, you should get one, No Name replied, and get it quick. Theo is going to be pissed about this, but Mosley is something else entirely. He's already lost several men to you two, and he won't let this go. Theo will have no choice but to authorize a full-scale assault on your base. Coleman sighed. The good news just keeps coming today, huh, Cap? He drawled. An attack is one thing, Tyrell said, blinking rapidly. But an all-out assault? No name nodded sharply. Could be a squad, could be a few dozen men, he replied. Or a drone strike. I'd say we're about to strike a nerve, Coleman muttered. So, when does this go down? Tyrell asked. How soon can you be ready? No name countered, straightening up. The captain took a deep breath. Sounds like your back is going to be against the wall thanks to my kill back there, he said. Can you set things in motion for tomorrow? Absolutely, the bold mercenary replied with a sharp nod. Rendezvous at the plantation house at noon? We'll be there with transport, Tyrell promised. Might want to bring some firepower too, No Name added. If things don't go well with the patrol boat, we could be coming in hot. We'll be ready for whatever they throw at us the captain said. No name nodded and extended his hand, shaking with each of them in turn. Gotta say, I'm glad you didn't heed my advice from the bridge, he admitted. You can thank me after we survive this, Tyrell replied. Speaking of... The bold mercenary nodded and raised his walkie-talkie to his lips. What's your status? We're spread out on the southern part of the base, but no sign of attackers, came the reply. Request permission to push north. Denied. No Name replied firmly. Start clearing the buildings on the south side. There's been no sign of them up here, and I'm going to have the patrols come back to clear the north. Don't want to give them an opportunity to slip out when you move. Yes, sir, came the reply, and he clicked the channel on the walkie-talkie. Kemp, do you copy? he asked. I'm here, Commander, Kemp replied. There has been an incident on base, No Name said. I need you and the rest of the patrols to come back immediately, north side. On the way, sir. Be there in ten, Kemp replied. Tyrell nodded. Guess that's our cue, he said. There's a small personnel gate to the north that is unguarded, No Name said. That will get you to the neighborhood. Lay low for ten, and you should be clear to get back to the water. The captain nodded again. We'll see you soon, he replied, and he led Coleman out. The soldier moved to the exit and then took a quick look around before moving as fast as they could towards the personnel gate. They found it unguarded, as promised, and snuck out, rushing towards the tree line that would take them to the safe house. Think we can trust him? Coleman asked. Tyrell shook his head. I think we're well beyond the point of debating that, he said. But we'll find out for sure tomorrow. Chapter 9 Lily, Ace, and Tate pushed another car into place on the bridge barricade gently easing it into position. The new configuration was nearly complete, with only a couple more cars to go. As the current one slid into position, Ace dropped to one knee. "'Good Lord, y'all,' he grunted. "'Why the hell are we pushing these big bitches?' "'I don't know if you noticed or not, cuz,' Lily drawled. "'But we don't have the keys.' He shook his head. "'I told y'all I could try and hotwire it,' he protested. This ain't a seventies muscle car, and this ain't a movie, she shot back. There's no way in hell you'd be able to get one of these new fancy cars up and running. He shrugged. What, you want to bet? I tell you what, Tate snapped, frustration evident in his tone. I'll give you five minutes to get that one over there started up, just cause then I don't have to listen to you fucking speak. Now go. Ace gave his cousin a smug look and strutted over to the next car. Tate approached her as she turned her attention towards the middle of the bridge. Maddox stood guard, baseball bat in hand, standing over the corpses of several zombies he'd recently struck down. He stared out across the bridge, away from the barricade, gripping his weapon tightly as a couple more creatures shambled towards him. He waited until they were within ten yards before moving, raising his bat up and delivering a kill shot to the lead ghoul. As it dropped, 
he reset himself before swinging again, caving in the side of another corpse's skull. He slammed the bat down on its face a few more times, screaming as he reduced it to complete mush. When it was clear his bat wasn't hitting anything but the ground anymore, he walked back to his starting spot, turning to stare down the bridge as if nothing had happened. Lily and Tate looked on, brows furrowed. Should... should we do something? she asked. Tate shook his head. Man's been through a lot, he murmured. He just needs to work it out for himself. I'm worried about him, she admitted, and knowing our history, for me to say that should really mean something. I know, Tate replied with a sigh, but I also know Maddox. He paused as the redneck in question lunged forward for another kill. We had this cousin, lived up near Orangeburg. It was a couple hours away by car, so we didn't really see much of him during the school year. But every summer, our daddy would throw us in the truck and take us up there for a few weeks. Maddox would practically count down the days until we got to go up there and see him. They were inseparable, getting into all kinds of trouble together. But just before his sophomore year of high school ended, Maddox got a call. That there had been an accident. Lily took a deep breath. Cousin didn't make it? She asked softly. No, ma'am, he did not, Tate replied, shaking his head. We never got the full story about what happened, but given how pissed off our daddy was, and how we never went back up there, even for the funeral, it was pretty clear one of the parents was at fault. I always thought it was drunk driving, but who really knows, and honestly, it doesn't really matter at this point. What matters is how Maddox took it. She clenched her jaw for a moment. You've seen him act like this before? She asked. That summer was a rough one, Tate said with a nod. At first he didn't even want to come out of his room. It took a few weeks, but I was finally able to coax him out. We went to this little fish camp restaurant down by the river. The kind of place where you could bring in your catch and they'd fry it up for you for a couple of bucks. Thought a day on the water would do him some good. Lily winced. Guessing it didn't, she asked. Oh, it did, for about fifteen minutes, Tate replied. A couple of rowdy kids set up about twenty yards from us, just being loud and obnoxious. I'm sure you know the type. Pretty sure my dating history is littered with them, she muttered. Then you know how annoying they can be, he continued. Normally Maddox would have went over and grabbed a beer and parted with them. On that day, though, he walked over and laid into them, started with some yelling, ended pretty quickly with Maddox beating the ever-loving hell out of a couple of them. Took two of us just to pull him off of one guy. He swallowed hard. It was just rage. Managed to get him home in one piece, and we got lucky that the boys weren't local. The description of a couple of rednecks in a pickup truck wasn't exactly a lot to go on especially in those days. Lily crossed her arms. How long was he like that? she asked. He spent a few weeks lashing out, Tate replied, tilting his head back and forth. I kept a tight leash on him after that, making sure he didn't get into any more trouble. Finally, one day, he just snapped out of it, went back to being normal. Maddox bashed in a zombie skull before leaping and dropping his elbow into its chest like a pro wrestler. He popped up off of the ground and started strutting around with his arms up as if he were playing to a crowd. Well, as normal as that boy gets, Tate muttered. Lily wrinkled her nose. So what do we do about him? she asked. Just gotta let him process things at his own pace, Tate said with a shrug. And, truth be told, probably not a bad thing to have him this riled up, given what's probably coming our way. She jutted out her chin. You think it's wise to send him up against mercenaries like this? She asked. I think we're outnumbered and outgunned. And that boy right there is a loaded shotgun, he said. We just need to point him in the right direction. Maddox bashed in a few more skulls in quick succession, and then let out a celebratory yell. Son of a whore! Ace barked from the car he was attempting to hotwire. 
This damn newfangled technology. That's one hell of a shock. Ready to concede defeat there, Kurz? Lily drawled. Ace sighed. Normally I'd say hell no, he replied. But in the interest of time, I'll wave the white flag. You all want to give me a hand? Lily and Tate walked over as he popped the car into neutral. They reached his position and started pushing the vehicle towards the bridge, about thirty yards away from its spot on the line. They struggled a bit, but finally got it properly lined up. All right, one more to go and this bridge is going to be as secure as it's going to get, Tate declared. Maddox let out another yell, caving in a lone zombie shambler. Forget the barricade, A strolled. Maybe we should just leave Maddox here to stand guard. Lily shook her head. Bigger fish to fry, cuz, she said. He sighed. Yeah, I guess you're right, he admitted, taking an extra beat to stare at his lost friend before sighing and turning to join Lily and Tate in grabbing the last car. Chapter 10 Terrell and Coleman worked their way cautiously through the neighborhood, back towards the safe house. They took a breather in a house a few blocks away, looking out the window as a few zombies shambled about. Anything? the captain asked. Coleman shook his head. Few of those things roaming around, nothing too major, he replied. No patrols? Terrell asked. His partner shook his head again. I haven't heard anything, he reported. So unless they're driving electric vehicles, I'd say we're in the clear. Terrell approached the window from the kitchen, handing over a bottle of water to his friend. They stared outside, keeping watch as they took a few minutes and enjoyed a break. Think Dante made it back to the safe house? Coleman finally asked. Terrell sighed. I think if he didn't, then you're the one who's going to tell Lily, he said. Sorry, Cap, but I'll go AWOL before I do that, Coleman quipped, and they shared a chuckle. I think he's fine, Terrell finally said. He can certainly handle himself. A couple of the zombies disappeared behind a house, clearing the way for them. Shall we? Coleman asked. Terrell chugged the rest of his water and nodded. The two of them tossed the empty bottles and headed out the front door, moving quickly but quietly through the neighborhood. They moved over a few streets, being careful to take up hiding spots before each house, keeping an eye out for any trouble. Finally, they reached the block with the safe house, relieved to find the road empty. Terrell gave his partner a nod and they sprinted out from cover, running hard and getting to the house. They peeked inside, making sure there wasn't any trouble. They were relieved when they didn't see any, but concerned when they didn't see anything, not even Dante. The captain approached the back patio door, sliding it open while drawing his handgun. He stepped inside slowly and Coleman cautiously followed him, closing it quietly behind him. Dante, you here? Terrell asked quietly. There were a few moments of silence before they heard a strange shuffling noise from across the house, putting them both on edge. They rushed to the hallway, taking up position and listening hard. A moment later, the bathroom door opened and Dante emerged, startling at the sight of the two soldiers. Jesus, man, Coleman said, lowering his gun. Did you not hear us come in? Dante scratched the back of his head. Apparently not, he said sheepishly. Glad you're back, though. Terrell inclined his head towards the bandage on the man's forearm. You good? he asked. Dante glanced at the dressed wound. Yeah, got nicked by a blade while taking one of them on, he replied. Weren't there two of them following you? Coleman asked, cocking his head. Yep, Dante replied. One of them took a bullet to the face before knives were drawn. Coleman blinked at him. And you took out another highly trained mercenary with just a knife? he asked. Nah, didn't bother to draw mine, Dante replied flippantly. Figured it would be more humiliating if I took his from him. Coleman stared at him, blinking again, his mouth opening and closing as he seemingly tried to figure out if the story was true or not. Dante simply stood there, confident, and finally the sniper chuckled, shaking his head. Remind me never to draw on you then, he said. Probably in your best interests, bud, Terrell joked. You're getting slow. Coleman dramatically winced as if he'd been shot. Come on, Cap, he groaned. That's hitting below the belt. So, what did you find out about Grace? Dante asked. They're getting her and the others out tomorrow, Terrell said. How? he demanded. Where? The captain raised his palms to calm down his friend. They have a boat, and they're going to smuggle them out, he said slowly. We have a rendezvous spot a few miles from the shore. From there, we're going to have a fight on our hands. How big of a fight? Dante asked. 
Let's just say I hope you didn't exaggerate the way you disarmed that guy today, Coleman piped up, because you're going to have plenty of opportunity to do it again tomorrow. You got a plan? Dunt asked. Terrell nodded sharply. A whole lot of guns, maybe an ambush or two, he replied, and hope that they don't follow us to the safe house. Dante took a deep breath. But they're really going to get her out? He asked hoarsely. Yeah, I think they are, Terrell replied softly. Dante took a moment, his eye tearing up a bit. It had been nearly a month before Grace had been taken, and even this bit of hope overwhelmed him. Okay, he finally said. Then let's get back and get set up. If it's a fight they want, then by God we're gonna give it to them. Terrell nodded in approval, giving Dante a firm smack on the shoulder. Come on, Coleman. You heard the man, he declared. Let's go prepare for war. Chapter 11 A helicopter landed in the parking lot near the command center. A handful of mercenaries emerged, followed by Kemp and No Name. When they made it away from the chopper, the duo cut away from the main group and lowered their voices. So, what are you going to tell Theo and Mosley? Kemp asked quietly. Can't imagine they are going to be too happy with you. No Name took a deep breath. What can I tell them? He replied, shaking his head. Delta hit us looking for weapons, and Charlie didn't make it. You think that's going to work? Kemp asked, gnawing at his lower lip. If not, then I need you to finish what we're doing, No Name said firmly. Kemp swallowed hard, contemplating that, but nodded in agreement. While they weren't sure that Theo would outright execute No Name, these days anything could happen. They hadn't thought they'd be going against Theo Atkinson and killing their own brothers in arms. Yet, here they were. What do you want me to tell Kenny and Nico? Kemp asked. Tell them we can get the VIPs to the water, but from there... We're open to suggestions. No name replied, going to move just before dawn. Don't worry, Commander, Kemp said. We'll have a plan in place. They exchanged a fist bump and he left, leaving no name to enter the command center alone. As soon as he crossed the threshold, everyone working inside stopped what they were doing to look at him. Mosley's ranting was muffled from Theo's office and no name sighed. He walked to the back and didn't bother knocking, opening the door and walking inside. Mosley burst out of his chair, drawing his gun and pressing the barrel to the bold mercenary's forehead. No name stopped in his tracks, not moving nor reacting to the offensive maneuver. Give me one good goddamn reason not to blow your brains all over the wall, Mosley shrieked. Theo sighed. Calm down, Mosley, he said. His subordinate turned to look at him, eyes wild. But he got Charlie killed and... No name smacked Mosley's arm away and ripped the gun out of his hand grabbing the back of his neck in the same motion and slamming him against the wall. The next time you put a gun to my head, he snarled, you damn well better pull the trigger, because I can assure you the next time I have you in this position you won't have time to beg for your life. Theo let out a deafening whistle. If your dick-swinging contest is over, can you start acting like functioning adults? He smacked his hands down on the table to accentuate his point. No name let Mosley go popping the magazine out of the gun and popping out the chambered round before tossing it in the trash. You can get that when we're done, he snapped, and then moved to the far side of the table, pocketing the mag and taking a seat. Mosley stomped to his own seat across from him in a huff. Now, talk to me like I'm fucking five years old, Theo continued, glaring at the bold mercenary, and help me understand just what the hell happened up there. No Name didn't miss a beat outwardly, despite inwardly being unusually nervous, knowing he was on thin ice. Delta paid us a visit, like we thought they would, he said, his tone level. They took out the front gate guards from a distance and got on base, causing a real mess. I don't know what they were looking for, or even if they got it, but they got away. So you want me to believe that Delta got onto the base, found whatever they were looking for, and got away without a trace? Theo snapped. Even with the overwhelming force we had stationed there? No name shook his head. Wasn't overwhelming at the time, sir, he replied. We had zombies in the area. Thought it might be an unconventional attack, so I sent out patrols to deal with the situation. So you purposely weakened defenses at the base, just as your friends were arriving? Convenient, Mosley declared. No name glared at him, but he simply laughed. 
Glare at me all you want, you bold motherfucker, Mosley said with a sneer. Doesn't change facts. You may not take your men's safety and security seriously, but I do, No Name snapped. Those neighborhoods near the base haven't been fully cleared, at least not thoroughly. All it takes is one civilian becoming a runner and things could escalate. Given the base wasn't exactly a high-value target for Delta, I took the cautious approach. Did it bite me in the ass? Yeah, it did. Would I do it again? Absolutely. When you're a real leader, you have to deal with the threat that's in front of you, not banking on a long shot to happen. I see it differently, Mosley replied, a smug gleam in his eye. I think you knew they were coming, so you pulled this zombie patrol bullshit to make it easy for them. To what end? No Name asked, spreading his arms. Huh? What could I possibly gain by Delta coming onto the base I'm in charge of? Mosley stared at him for a moment, and then flopped back in his chair. Haven't quite worked that out yet, he admitted, crossing his arms. Maybe it has something to do with you being sweet on that girl on the boat. No Name rolled his eyes. If he's done grasping at straws, may I call it a day? he asked, turning to Theo. I've already faced one attack today, and I've had my fill of this verbal one. Theo waved a hand at the door flippantly. Get rested, he said. We have a busy day tomorrow. I wasn't aware we had any operations tomorrow, No Name said, brow furrowing. Well, Delta did just attack us, Theo said. We're going to have an all-hands-on-deck moment to root them out and send them off to the next life. No Name nodded and got to his feet, ignoring Mosley's smirk on his way out. Don't tell me you're buying his horseshit story. Mosley begged as soon as the door closed behind No Name. Do I think it's possible that he sent out patrols to take care of a few stragglers? Theo asked with a sigh. Yes, although it is one hell of a coincidence that Delta chose that exact moment to get onto base. Mosley straightened. How do you want to handle it, sir? he asked. Theo got up and paced the room, clasping his hands behind his back. As you can imagine, No Name has sacrificed more than most for this company. For this country, when you get down to it, he said. It almost feels like a sin to even contemplate that he might be working against us, he sighed. But I can't ignore the facts before me, he paused, turning towards his subordinate. You mentioned him being sweet on a girl. What was that about? One of the VIPs on the boat, Mosley replied. He's been spending a lot of time with her, training her and whatnot. And you don't think it's innocent? Theo asked. Mosley shook his head vehemently. No, sir, I do not, he declared. Okay, we'll play to your hunch, his leader replied. You have a man you can put on watch? Yes, sir, Mosley said, getting to his feet and grinning. I'll have him sitting on that boat just waiting for that bold fucker to show up. No, no, Theo said quickly, raising his palms. I don't want you to do anything that might tip him off and change his plan. Have them watch away from the boat, out of sight. One of No Name's men is on guard duty tonight, so if they're going to try something, it'll be then. If they're trying to get the girl out, they ain't getting off the island on the roads, Mosley mused. We should probably alert the boat patrols. Theo nodded. I'll have them be on alert, he said. Everything gets stopped, no exceptions. Mosley cracked his knuckles. All right, let's go catch this traitorous Bastard, he cried. Hey, Theo snapped. This is nothing to celebrate or be excited about. This man is one of our own who has fought side by side with us in some of the worst shit imaginable. This apocalypse hasn't been easy on anyone, and if he has turned against us, we owe him the respect to put him down quickly. He raised his chin. Is that understood? Mosley composed himself, but his eyes still danced with excitement. Yes, sir, he said. Good. Now get to work, Theo said, waving him off. Mosley scurried away, and as soon as he made it out, he grinned deviously to himself, knowing No Name's time was short. Chapter 12 Kemp knocked on the door of a villa down by the water. A few moments later, the door opened, revealing Kenny. Hey, the man said, blinking in confusion. Wasn't expecting to see you tonight. Things are happening, Kemp said quietly. 
wondering if I could have a word with you and Captain Nico. As if on cue, Nico called from the living room. Kenny, my friend, who is at the door? Just a friend, Kenny replied, stepping out of the way. Kemp entered the house, and Nico got to his feet, spreading his arms as if it were a joyous occasion. Kemp, my friend, good of you to stop by, he bellowed. What can I get you to drink? The mercenary shook his head. I think I'm okay, thank you, Nico, he said. Nonsense, the captain replied. Where I come from, it is improper to have a social gathering without a drink in your hand. Or are you here to discuss business? Kemp nodded. I'm afraid I am, he said. In that case, we must have two, <laughs> Nico declared. Kemp couldn't help but chuckle and nodded. Just nothing too heavy, he said. Okay, my friend, I go easy. Nico replied and poured a healthy portion of some unknown liquid into a glass, mixing a few other random ingredients in before stirring and bringing it over. Old family recipe, he said. Kicks like a mule, too, Kenny added. Kemp shook his head. So much for getting a light drink, he muttered. Trust me, you are, Kenny said. They shared a brief laugh before Nico motioned for them to sit down around a small table. He raised his glass and the three of them toasted. Okay, my friend, tell me what business we have tonight, Nico said. We're moving the cargo in a few hours, Kemp said. Has to be before dawn. The captain slowly sipped his drink. How can I be of help? he finally asked. We have a way to get him off the boat and into the water, Kemp said quietly. But past that, we're open to suggestions. Nico took another big gulp before leaning forward. Okay, my vessel, the SS Live in the Dream, is a few boats down from where they are being kept, he said. I have a secret hatch just underneath the bow. It is right at the water's edge, so they will have to approach from underneath. Kenny raised an eyebrow. Isn't that a dangerous place to have a hatch? he asked. I have found that not having a way out when you are being boarded by pirates is a lot more dangerous. Nico replied shortly. Kenny raised a hand. Fair enough, he said. Getting them on board is only half the battle, Kemp continued. We have to get them to the mainland as fast as possible, while avoiding the patrols. Nico smirked. You let me worry about the patrols, he said. Everyone here should know who I am, and if they don't, they're going to get a very big reminder. So, once we get to the mainland, then what? Kenny asked. We have a rendezvous point with the others, Kemp replied. They're providing transport to a safe house for us. After that, I'm not really sure where we're headed. All I know is that none of us are going to be able to come back here. Nico took a long look at his drink before finishing it off, motioning for the others to follow suit. Once they were empty, he grabbed all three glasses, heading to the bar to make another batch. Sometimes doing the right thing means putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, he said. If this is our last night in comfort, we are going to enjoy ourselves. Kemp took a deep breath. Here, here, he said. The captain came back over, passing out the drinks, and they all toasted again. To doing our part to make the world a better place. Kemp and Kenny clinked glass with him, and all three drank. They didn't know how tomorrow was going to go, nor what the future held, but this moment might just be the last good one they got to have for quite some time. The End Up next, the high-risk plan to rescue Grace and the other civilian captives from the clutches of QXR begins. <laughs> 